Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Noreen, and I'm here to talk about text lacks empathy. Looks like there's a lot of you doing text at the moment. Um, <laughs> no, it takes a while to wake up, but that's all right. Um, we are all, more or less, you know, to varying degrees, hairless monkeys. Um, we've evolved to be very social creatures. And there are actually special parts of our brain that are dedicated to recognizing faces. Even in people who have face blindness, and so they don't connect the faces with the people that they know, um, those areas of the brain light up when they see pictures of, of human faces in a way that they don't when they see a picture of a car or a duck or, or something else. Um, monkeys keep their social groups together by grooming each other, by picking fleas off each other. Um, humans have much bigger social groups and, and slightly different hygiene mores. Uh, <laughs> a conservative estimate puts the mean at about 150 people uh, groups for humans, whereas the next uh, biggest social group within the primates uh, have about 60 individuals per social group. Um, language is what enables us to have bigger social groups, and it enables us to communicate about what we need, but also about how we're feeling. Uh, empathy comes when you translate it into German, is Einfühlung. So it's one, Einfühlung, feeling. Um, and it's this sense of connecting with other people and sharing the one feeling, understanding what they are feeling and transmitting to them what you are feeling. Um, the OED describes it as the power of projecting one's personality into and so fully comprehending the object of contemplation. I've never gotten quite that far myself, but it's a nice ideal. The only problem is that a lot of our online communication lacks empathy. Um, this is a commercial that uh, will show you what happens when the emotion is removed from a conversation. If I can just get it to play here. Oh, don't give me that. What, did your wife wolf it down for breakfast? <laughs> that came out wrong. So I don't know if you got that, but uh, when, you, when you remove the communication of, yes, that was funny, I got the joke, suddenly what was a joke between two people who seem to know each other well, have a good relationship, becomes this, oh my God, what's just happened? <gasps> Unfortunately, when there's an emotional void, we have a tendency to fill it with negative emotions. And the more important the conversation is, the more stress we're under, the more likely we are to do this. So if you've ever gotten an email like this, is your reaction, oh boy, I'm getting a raise, it's gonna be great. Or is it, oh shit, what did I do? The problem with this is, as I said, text lacks empathy. Communication is about words, but it's also about the emotions that are backing those words. And a lot of content is conveyed outside of the words that we use. Um, I was a linguistics student, and so I've spent a lot of my career looking at sentences like this. Um, and part of the reason that this sentence is hard to understand is because we've removed some of the context. Uh, there are a couple of ways of putting the context back in. We can do pictures. Um, or we can make the words clearer. This expansion is slightly bogus for any linguists actually looking at it, but it's hard to draw a parse tree in, in ASCII art on a slide at a size that you'll actually be able to read it. Um, so the ship shipping ships phrase is missing linguistic content. Um, because ship can be a verb or a noun and we don't mark that in English, it's ambiguous. But there are other kinds of context that we can be missing. Um, do we have any other writers in the room? We have at least a couple. Um, I'm a technical writer by day, and I work on a team with two other writers in a company with a few dozen engineers. And when I write something, it basically goes research, draft, read, edit, read, ask somebody else to read, ask an expert to read, edit, ask a non-expert to read, edit, read, edit, publish. Um, does anybody write emails like that? I don't. Even, even when I'm being good and I write the email and then I wait overnight and I send it, then, like I don't go through a full writing process 
when I'm, when I'm communicating on a lot of my open source projects. And that's fine if you're just sharing pictures of ponies. Um, but when you're trying to solve complex technical or social problems, it doesn't work. There, those edits actually have a purpose, and it's not just to keep the engineers busy. Um, some of those edits clarify content. That's why we have an expert and a non-expert read things. Uh, some of them change the register, so t whether I'm talking very formally about something, which might be, say, in a white paper, or whether I'm talking more informally in an email or a help article. And when I'm sending emails, some of, or when I'm sending, you know, emotive content, some of those edits put that emotion back in. They try to evoke empathy, they try to get the reader on side, make them feel happy, make them feel like this is something we can do, positive, all of that. As I said, the problem is that most of us don't actually write our emails. We talk with our fingers. Um, trained writers can inject emotion into text, we work very hard at it. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, we think about our audience and what mindset they might be in and what mindset we want them to be in. But most people write on IM and in email in a very similar way to the way that they speak. And you'll, you'll recognize this when you get emails from particular people and you're reading the email and you can actually hear that person yelling you out or encouraging you or, or whatever it is. But when we speak, we rely on having all of these extra dimensions of communication, all of these emotional side channels, and without realizing it, when we're sending email or, or instant messages, those are gone, and it can drastically alter the meaning, and we don't necessarily know why or what's gone wrong. Um, a sentence like this looks much less ambiguous than the ships shipping ships, but it's not. There are seven different ways that I can read that sentence. I didn't say you stole my money. Jane said it. I didn't say you stole my money. I wasn't talking. I didn't say you so stole my money, but it sure looks like it. I didn't say you stole my money. Mike did. I didn't say you stole my money. I just think you spent it poorly. I didn't say you stole my money. That was Bill's. And I didn't say you stole my money. It's my laptop that's gone. So each of those different readings, how do you tell the difference between them when it's a text? Putting the emphasis on the right syllable works in voice. Um, but there are other things that we need to have too. We have tone of voice. So if somebody says to me, am I pronouncing your name right? And I say, sure, it's fine. Versus if I say, sure, it's fine. It's a very different communication. It's a very different message that they receive. But if I write, sure, it's fine, what have you got? As I said, when we have these emotional voids, we tend to fill them with negatives. Um, when we're face to face, we've got expressions. I can see whether you're looking at your laptops or looking at me. I can see whether you're looking confused or interested. Sometimes I get this wrong. I've had people sitting in talks. I had one guy at one point who was looking really, really angry, and I thought, what have I done? What have I said? And it turned out that was just his interested face. <laughs> um, we have hand movements. I don't, I, I don't know whether any of you have been watching my hands, but I talk a lot with my hands. You know, if, if, if I have to keep my hands by my side, suddenly my brain, in a certain sense, doesn't, doesn't quite work the same way, and it's much harder to get the words out. Um, we have physical position and body language, and there are cultural variants in these, but they are so important. They're so strong, they're, we're so tuned to look for them, that we actually see them in things and in animals that don't have them. Okay? You, you, you look at this and you recognize, you know, I'm the king of the world, but I couldn't even tell you what kind of an animal that is. What did we say? It's an anteater? Okay, I don't think we have anteaters in Ireland. Um, <laughs> historically, our online communities have tended to be a social skills free zone. Um, often deliberately so, we excuse awkwardness or even rudeness with labels like autism and Asperger's. But actually, 
this talk isn't about neurodiversity, but we can learn a lot from the autistic and Asperger's community. Um, and one of the things we learn is that having those things is not the same as having poor social skills. Like anything else, people, all kinds of people, learn these things. And the same way that we learn to read and write, we also learn social skills. We learn them growing up. We learn very different social skills in different cultures and communities and countries. Um, and it's easier for some people than others. But even if you have a learning disability, whether it's dyslexia, whether it's, you know, you're not very good at pointers, whatever it is, you can still learn these things. I know this can be done because I've done it myself. If you were at the bar camp tonight, last night, you might not actually believe it, but I'm a serious introvert. I know, I know. I have learned all this stuff in the same way that I've learned to write. It's something you practice, you go on, you practice, you go on, you practice, you go on, and you get to a point where you're fine standing up in front of a room of people and ad-libbing silly things about talk proposals. When I was a teenager, I used to come home from school and my mum would ask, how was your day? And I didn't always want to talk about it, but you know, she would ask and so I would tell her. And I just assumed that if she wanted to tell me about her day, she would tell me about her day. But she would get quite hurt that I didn't ask how her day was, because I was making this assumption that, well, if she wants to tell me, she'll tell me. And for her, it was part of a social interaction that I should say, my day was great, and I did this and that, and how was your day, mum? And those are just rules that we can learn. We can do this as a like, social code. Really, there are, there are steps you can take. Um, but learning all of these rules is a process. It's a continual process. Sometimes it's really exhausting. Um, I kind of say that when I'm in a large group, I'm running on emulation. So I can be extroverted and have this bubbly personality. But it's not that I'm hardwired to be that way. It's that I've learned to be that way, and I practice being that way. Um, this talk is not remedial geek socialization, although I have done that one before. Um, but it's also for people who are naturally good at those things and naturally good communicators. It's useful to see from the other side, to see how people are thinking, to see how those miscommunications are coming about. Um, and hopefully you'll learn a little bit about how to correct for those. Um, and the special cases that come with online communication. So before we jump into the second half of the talk, where we're going to talk about some of those strategies, is everybody with me so far? Excellent. If you have questions at any point, just put up your hand, wave, whatever it is, and uh, I'll take them as we go along. If I'm going too fast also, please let me know. So are any of you familiar with oblique strategies? It used to be a deck of cards, and now it's an app you can have on your phone. Um, and it's designed to help you with creative thinking. So when you're stuck on a problem, you pull a card off the deck, and they have these oblique strategies, like look at it from the outside, or do nothing for as long as possible, listen to the quiet voice. And they're not really advice so much as reminding you of ways to think about the problem. And so here are some oblique strategies for online communication. The first one is tact filters. How many of you have heard of this? Really? One or two? OK. Um, Jeff Bigler came up with this in the early 90s when uh, a friend of his who was at MIT was regularly finding herself upset by other people who were working in her lab. And the idea is that you can put these filters, you can put tact filters on the output when you're speaking, you can be polite and nice and, and you know, preface your comments with how are you and things like that. Or you can put it on your input when you're listening uh, and, and just assume that when somebody says, here, give me that, what they mean is, do you mind if I borrow your VGA dongle? Um, the problem is that geeks have this tendency to use tact filters differently from other people. Ordinary people put tact on their output and they expect their input to come pre-filtered with politeness. Um, whereas geeks tend to put tact on their input and we expect that, you know, this person isn't actually meaning to be a jerk. That's fine. You know, we're, we're all just getting it done as efficiently as possible. The problem is when 
a geek and an ordinary person talk, then there's no tact and the geek comes off as really rude. And conversely, when it goes the other way around, there's all this tact and some, a normal person is saying please and thank you and being very polite. And the geek is thinking, well, they just get to the damn point. Um, so what we can learn from this is just adjust your tact to the audience. On a mailing list, that might be you know, reading a few posts, lurking for a while till you figure out what is the baseline here. Um, at a party, it's conversation surfing. Just hang out in a few different conversations, see where people are going. Um, it takes a little bit of work, and it's not always obvious, you know, even after you have listened for a while. Um, but a default, a good default is always to have a little bit of tact on your output, but also on your input. Um, and you can, you can template this. Here's, a, here's an email tact template. Hello, name. All the things I had written in this email that I was going to say anyway. Thanks, Noreen. Like, it's, it's that simple. It's, it's put that line at the top, put those two lines at the bottom, and leave the rest of your email as it was. And suddenly, you've got a little bit of tact, you have this sense that, okay, this person is not just bombarding me with questions or suggestions or bug reports, but we're actually having a conversation and a communication. Um, even if you wanted to throw a few extra pleases in, that usually works great too. Um, and even the most tactless geek can strip this template off. They can just ignore the first line and ignore the... the so you end up hopefully balancing your tact a little bit better with your, with your audience. Perception is reality. It doesn't actually matter whether you intended to attack somebody or not. If they read your email and they feel attacked, that's their reality and they're no longer listening to what you're saying. Um, you have to help them understand that that was not your intention before you can actually get to dealing with whatever the technical content of, of your communication was. So listen to what's said and try not to second guess. Those emotional voids, rather than filling them, try to actually communicate and say, hey, this seemed like you were really cross with me about this. What's going on? Um, a, a sort of a tangential to that is set expectations and don't just disappear. Um, if, you just, if you're having a conversation with somebody and suddenly it's five o'clock, it's Friday, great, pub time, and the conversation is gone and they're going, did I, like, did I really upset him or what went on there? Let people know what's going on, say, you know, send them an email and say, yep, yeah, it's, it's half four here on Friday. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say about this, but I might not get back to you until Monday. Yeah, I'm going on holidays for a week. If I don't reply, that's why. Um, this is sort of a kindergarten level one. The other person doesn't actually know how you feel. They are not inside your brain. They do not know all the things that you know. They do not know all the things that are going on in your life. Uh, they can't hear you. They don't know if, if you're annoyed because the cat just won't decide whether it wants in or out. Um, when we speak, we rely on all of those extra emotional side channels. And without realizing it, they're gone, and that can drastically alter the meaning of what we're saying. So we have to try and bring those channels back. And sometimes that can seem awkward at first. Uh, have any of you played Mass Effect 2? There's a species called the Elcor um, that communicate that all of their emotions using these very, very subtle scents and infrasound vibrations. And, and so to humans, they sound completely flat and monotone. So uh, here we have a little clip, if I can get the mouse over to the right place. Now, the insincere endorsement sounds pretty insincere to us anyway, 
Um, but the point is that, that the Elcor have learned that they have to preface their statements with an emotive to say, insincere endorsement, or happily, or with great affection. Because to, to, to their listeners, all of these things sound the same, and they don't sound positive. Um, so state your emotions. If a conversation over text isn't going well, and you can't figure out why, state your emotions and state your assumptions. Tell the other person what you're hearing. It can be as simple as saying, I'm pissed off about this, or this makes me happy. The one I find myself using most often is sincerely or honestly, because people can think, particularly when you say, yeah, you should go ahead and do that, it can often be taken as this, that's a stupid idea, and I have no intention of being involved with it. Whereas what it more often means for me is, that's a really good idea, and I'm working on all of these other things, and I don't have time to help you with it, but you should go ahead and do it. And so saying, honestly, I think that's a really good idea, rather than just saying, yeah, I think that's a really good idea. Um, it puts that that emotion back in that you don't have in the text. Um, and it can be a revelation for the other side that drags the conversation back on track when they realize that actually you're happy about this or you're annoyed about it or whatever it is. Um, a, to a tool we have from the world of nonviolent communication, which is sort of, I always find a funny, I mean, is the, is the rest of our communication really violent? No, hopefully not, but paraphrasing. This is essentially error checking. This is, this is your, your control bit for the human language. Somebody says something to you, and you, say, you tell them back the summary of what you heard so that they have an opportunity to say, wait, that's, that's not what I meant at all. Um, so if, you, if somebody says to you, somebody said to me the other night, oh, is that going to be your tagline for the next five years? And I was kind of hurt by that. And I sent them an email and I said, look, you know, when you said that, I thought you were being really dismissive and I actually care about the issue we were talking about. And he said, no, 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 no. What I meant was, are you going to be working on this like f on an ongoing basis because I think it's something that needs to be worked on? And so we went from me feeling really hurt and him going, why did she just huff off, to, oh, okay, we're friends again now, we can figure this out. You know, He's not necessarily interested in working in the same things I am, but at least I know he's supportive of what I'm doing and, and that kind of thing. These are some of my favorite ways of, uh, of getting communication, getting some empathy into text. Some people consider emoticons kind of childish. I think they're actually really powerful, compact indicators of emotion. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with this one, it's uh, flipping, flipping a table. So when you're really, really annoyed, like just phew, um, it, it's maybe not the very clearest example, but uh, I think it's kind of funny. <laughs> you see it? You see the little guy and the, yeah. Okay. Um, do, we have any more do we have any questions? Are we all still on track? Excellent. Um, Another idea, fill in the blanks. As I said, as we saw in the video with the butcher, um, these emotional voids are there. The human tendency is to fill them with negative emotion. Don't do that. And don't project your own emotions. Ask, clarify, assume good intent. As Luke said in his keynote, I'd much rather you thought I was stupid than thought I was evil. Um, point out when you think you're missing something. I can't tell whether you like this idea or not. I don't know whether, whether you're supportive or whether you think I'm being stupid here. Um, and when you detect sarcasm, because it's not going to be an if, respond with sincerity. If somebody is being a jerk, be nice to them. Being a jerk to them, if you, if you haven't tried it, I'm sure you've at least seen it. Has it worked? Has it ever worked? Has, has being a jerk to somebody who's being a jerk ever made the conversation more productive? Because I've never seen it make the conversation more productive. Um, so be nice. And I know it's hard. And, and have friends you can go to and go, 
that guy is being an idiot. That's fine. But do that off-channel with somebody else and, and in, the converse, in the technical conversations and, and in your emails, try and be nicer than they are. Um, there, there, there's a technical community here in Portland where uh, we, the uh, women, women get together and, and often starts off with uh, complaining about things we've had to put up with in the workplace and that kind of thing. And uh, the strategy that we've come up with is trying to out-nice people. Uh, once, you, once you start trying to out-nice somebody, it turns out that they often find that they're responding in kind. And, and it becomes this, you know, let's, okay, let's work together. Let's get this done. Let's lean in rather than leaning out. Sometimes, no matter what you do with your text, it's just not working. Um, and those are the times it's good to increase the empathic, in, increase the emotional bandwidth. Um, I hesitate to say that some media have, have more inherent empathy, but they certainly make it an awful lot easier. If email isn't working, try switching to a more immediate communication mechanism like IM or IRC. Um, be careful with this when you're dealing with people from a different language background to you, because it can make it more difficult for them to, to communicate even though it makes the emotional side of things easier, it can make the technical side harder. But it can pull you back on track to say, okay, we're all on the same team here. Um, when you're not writing essays to each other, also, also it varies if, if you have one person who's typing very, very fast and just flooding and flooding, this doesn't always work. Switching to the phone, picking up the phone and calling someone, is a really good way of increasing the emotional bandwidth. And it doesn't need to be a big, long conversation. Again, these are ways of getting back on track so that you can have the technical conversations that you actually wanted to have in the first place. Um, video chat. Video chat nowadays. When I, when I started doing video chat, uh, it was for work. And most commonly, I was the only person in, in my room. And everybody else was in a room like a minimum light speed 50 milliseconds away. Um, 10 milliseconds is, is typically the, the threshold at which humans can recognize delay. So these guys were fairly far away, even if we had been using absolutely light speed communications. They were 18 people in a room. It was bloody awful. But nowadays, we have technology. The technology has improved and our internet connections have improved. The only thing I would say is don't put 18 people in one room and one person in the other. I, that's, no, put everybody on a level playing field. Yeah, so the, it was, was Nat Friedman, you said? Yeah. Had a, had a blog post about this when he was working at Novell, um, and their policy was that everybody should be dialed in individually to the meeting. You know, even if you're 10 guys in the same space, that's okay. You all dial in on your own phone so that everybody is at the same disadvantage or the same, it's a level playing field. Um, you, I find you don't necessarily have to be that strict. Sometimes you need to enforce that rule to get away from the 18-person conference room. Um, the company I'm working at now, we're mostly remote, and we find it works if you have up to sort of two or three or four people in one place and, and then individuals scattered around. Um, but beyond that, it does get quite overwhelming. Um, also, I haven't yet found any audio system that's good enough to pick up all of those 18 people in a room. Um, so you're going to have little back chatter conversations going on that you can kind of hear something's happening, but you can't tell what they're saying and all of that kind of stuff. And it, so it ends up with the people who are not in that room feeling left out. And again, perception is reality. Even if they're not being left out, even if the back channel is, can you see the screen? I can't see the screen. They, the people who are on the remote end feel left out, and then you get these bad feelings and... and the cooperation just plummets. Um, yeah, voice adds inflection. 
Video adds facial expressions, adds body language. Is, is somebody you know, excited about the idea? Are they really not looking like they want to be there at all? Um, and finally, get off your ass and go and talk to people. Right? Real life is absolutely, hands down, the best way of increasing the emotional bandwidth. Um, it's hard. It's, it's expensive. It takes time. How do you get all of these people together in one room at one time? Um, I'm on, on an advisory board for a nonprofit, and there are nine advisors. And trying to get all of us in one space, even only trying to get the half dozen who are on the west coast of the US in one space, it's a nightmare. But it's well worth it. Um, if you're in an office, be the programmer who goes up, who stands up, walks over to the sales guys or the support guys or whoever it is that's questioning you and says, hey, what's going on? How can I help you? Have those conversations. You will be a miracle worker. Um, That is, that is what Mercer Meyer is trying to do at Yahoo right now. Um, yeah, it's, it, it works. There are other really good reasons that remote working works. But I, I'm a remote worker. I've been a remote worker for a long time. And honestly, if you told me you can have you know, 10 times your salary, but you never get to go to the office, I wouldn't take it. I absolutely have to go to the office. Don't have to do it very often. For me, I find every two, three months, I go down for a week. And I don't actually get a whole lot of productive work done when I'm down there. I really don't. I am way more productive by any measure when I am sitting at my own desk at home with nobody else around and I haven't seen anybody for two weeks. But I have to go down and make those connections and have those human relationships. Laura. Yeah, so Laura's, sorry. Laura is pointing out that part of that is building those relationships and trust so that when you get those emails, it's not simply an email from a computer or, you know, we've, we've passed the Turing test. We recognize that these are people, these are individuals, they have hobbies, they have likes and dislikes, they have families, you know. It doesn't matter if you go to the office and all you talk about is the Super Bowl. That's fine, that's okay. Just have those human relationships. They also have expectations. I mean, you're counting on the work that you do, and uh, they're appreciative when the work gets done. And, uh, uh, so that, when they, that, uh, that is something that's more easily communicated that people really care about what you're doing and count on that what you're doing in person. Yeah, so the, Marvin was making the point that people have expectations. Um, and I think people have expectations when they've never met you. What they don't have, and, and the second part you pointed out was they have an appreciation. Um, and it's easier to communicate that appreciation, that, that your work is valued, and you as a, as a person are valued. Um, and it's much easier to communicate that when you're sitting beside someone, and you can say, oh, thanks for that, or you know, that was great, or I really appreciated you helping me out with those release notes, or whatever it is. Um, yeah, we're, we're human beings, and we have this need to be loved. It's, it's, like, it's literally up there with food and water and air. Um, we need to have these personal connections, or we just can't thrive. Um, I only have a few minutes left, so we'll try and get through one or two more. Um, it's not a competition. Rate limit. If you find yourself sending three emails to the one person you know, even over the course of a whole morning. Slow down. It's okay. Um, the faster you send, the less you're comprehending. Right? The faster you are sending out those emails, the less attention you're paying to each of those emails. It's like you, you just can't compress attention like that. Um, but also, the less the person on the other end is paying attention to what they're receiving from you. Right? You all know. You, 
all of you who have your laptops open and have the emails in front of you, you know there are people who when you see the email from that person, you go, oh, I don't need to read that now. He's always sending me an email. It'll, it'll wait. It'll be fine. So rate limit your sending. Um, again, on the it's not a competition, find common ground. Um, argue interests, not positions. And uh, we might have to skip ahead to get to the, to the required reading section. But these slides will be up online later. Um, Getting to Yes is a really good book to read uh, for any kind of communication. It talks about negotiation, but it turns out that all of our communication is negotiation. Um, quit trying to win. Decide what you need. Communicate. Communicate as clearly as you can, and then stop talking. If the other person isn't giving you what you need, go find it elsewhere. Yelling at them, hammering on at them is not going to get it to happen. If you need to, find another route. Find somebody else who can help you to persuade. That's fine. But banging on and banging on. If you keep doing what you've always done, if they're not responding, they're not going to start responding just because you asked them three more times. Um, these are Grice's maxims. Again, these slides will be online later, and uh, you can get them. I'm starting to run out of time. Um, use the passive. The writers I know are having a momentary cringe at this, but bear in mind that we're not writing. We're talking with our fingers. Um, when you're talking with your fingers, using the passive can be a really good way of just lowering the tension and getting away from finger pointing. And it's, this is the difference for those of you who, who don't have a, a linguistic or, or grammar background. It's the difference between saying, you broke the build, so there's this emotional arousal, and nobody's really listening to what you need next. They're just, well, I didn't break the build, or, well, I broke the build, but there was this thing that needed it. And then the other way of saying it is, someone broke the build, which is sort of finger pointy still, and it's, it's I didn't do it. Someone broke the build. But um, in English, we have this construction that that doesn't actually exist in, in a lot of other languages, where we can just say, the build broke. Um, the, the build broke. I, I don't know how it happened. I don't care how it happened. The build broke. The build broke itself, essentially. Who, like, who broke it, how it broke, when it broke is not the point. The build needs to be fixed. And now we can start working on that together. Um, when you're wrong, say so. When the other person is right, say so. When you're right, shut up. If you're really right, somebody else will realize. They may or may not point it out. That's OK. Um, when the other person is wrong, shut up. Point out the brokenness, but don't point fingers. If somebody is persistently wrong, and, and it's really hampering your ability to get work done, take them aside and talk to them about it at some point when things are not broken. When things are broken, just, just get on to fixing them. Um, give people an out. Face is something that's talked about a lot in Eastern cultures, less so in our culture. It's not something that we care about less. It's just something that we talk about less. Don't corner people. Let them save face. Give them a way of, of getting on with fixing the problem without having to say, yeah, OK, I made a mistake. Um, be, all of this is part of be human. Be, be willing to admit when you don't know. Say, I'm sorry. Say, thank you. If you broke the build and it paged someone at 3 AM, bring scotch. <laughs> um, and the final one I'll give you, because I really have run out of time, if it doesn't matter, do it their way. If it doesn't matter and you still want to do it your way, you're lying. It matters, OK? And if, if, it, if, it, if you're saying it doesn't matter, but we still have to do it my way, think about that and go, well, why do we have to do it my way? What is there about this that matters? And then explain that. Because then we can get somewhere, and we can move on, and we can, we can say, yes, OK, we'll do it your way. Or we can say, no, we're not going to do it your way, but here's the reasons why. Um, and if you're arguing for the sake of arguing, don't do that. 
or do it at Toastmasters or, or some, you know, do it at your local debate club, the Model United Nations, whatever you like, but not on your technical lists, please. Um, I hope you've gotten something out of some of these strategies. As I said, the slides will be online with much less fast talking later. Um, and I will be around for the rest of the day if you have any questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>